So, I was on me and Atheist Chat Show, uh, Truth Wanted, with my buddy, Objectively Dan. And I was talking with uh, kind of a famous atheist. Her name is Rachel Oates. Uh, she's a YouTube channel. It's up and coming. It's growing pretty fast. And Rationality Rules, actually. Yeah, Rationality Rules. The center of the... Right before the, the whole transphobic controversy. It was right before the Stonewall collapsed. And I can't believe how hateful and transphobic he was. I, could, I, could, I couldn't believe it. But so anyways, I was talking to them about um, Jordan Peterson. And I offered to them in the course of the conversation that Jordan Peterson was a revolutionary. Now, Rachel Oates in particular said, do you really think he's a revolutionary? <laughs> okay, I'll work on my Rachel Oates. Do you really think that he's a revolutionary? I mean, that type of thing has been around for, for hundreds of years. And she, was, she started referencing things like Joseph Campbell and uh, Jung and how there's nothing all that revolutionary about Jordan Peterson. Now... This is true. So let me back up the case that Jordan Peterson is in fact revolutionary. So let's examine the idea of being a revolutionary. First and foremost, all revolutions, all revolutionaries have antecedents. That's a given. Oftentimes those antecedents are mundane. She said Joseph Campbell, his ideas came from Joseph Campbell. Joseph Campbell's pretty mundane. Okay, Henry Ford, for example, was a revolutionary, revolutionized our relationship to the automobile. It was based on really, really mundane things. It made it easier to build, the assembly line process, so it was cheaper to buy. That's it. That was the revolution. Easier to build, quicker to build, so cheaper to buy. Bang, revolution. All of a sudden, he transformed the whole way we live. So, antecedents that are mundane is, is not uncommon when you're talking about revolutionaries. Now, let's take another type of revolutionary. The Sex Pistols are revolutionary. Sex Pistols, you know, w when they came out, it was late 70s. The Iggy and the Stooges were debatably even more revolutionary um, because he came out in 1969. Same type of idea, same type of music. It was a lot more radical in 1969. 1969, you had stuff on the radio like, Do you believe in magic? In a young girl's heart, make you feel groovy like an old time movie. And the Stooges come along and say, you know, now I wanna be your dog. Now I wanna be your dog. Oh, come on. It's debatable, but could the Sex Pistols have even occurred without the groundwork, the antecedents of Iggy and the Stooges? I don't think so. I'm not really sure. And there was a lot of precursors to the Sex Pistols. So what really was the revolution that they brought, brought around when they came about? Well, they kind of struck a nerve because it was a certain type of music introduced into England in the late 70s in a time when the economy was hurting and you had a really powerful class struggle. So it really struck a chord with people. And really, honestly, why it was revolutionary, they did nothing more than popularize it. Popularize a type of music and an attitude that had been around for, you know, 15, 20 years. There were other antecedents. Richard Hell and the Voida. It's the whole safety pin, pinning the shirts together with the safety pins. That came from Richard Hell and the Voida. You know, the Ramones, New York Dolls. There was a lot of antecedents. So what did they actually do that was revolutionary? Kind of just popularized it. Sex Pistols' album went to number one. <laughs> you know, Iggy and the Stooges honestly couldn't sell an album to save their life. Honestly, they couldn't. It wasn't until the Sex Pistols came around that everybody took notice of that type of music. The, the first four album by Iggy and the Stooges, he was so much marching to the beat of his own drummer, I'm pretty sure they were taken off the market originally. Nobody bought him. Nobody cared. Yeah, he was doing revolutionary, interesting new type of music, but people didn't really have it in any context where it meant anything to him. That's very important when you talk about a revolutionary. So, what? What am I saying about revolutionaries? Oftentimes the sourcing is mundane and it's nothing more than popularizing. That, that's one way of looking at it. It transforms the way you handle a given subject or listen to music or drive a car. But, you know, how, how that occurs and why. So let's take a look at Jordan Peterson in light of that. Really, what she said I don't quibble with. Yes, Jordan Peterson is not unique. I've said this many times on my videos. Jordan Peterson is not some super prophet. He's not a genius. He's not Nietzsche. He's not Dostoevsky. And his roots are mundane. And he makes no, 
it, you can you can investigate the stuff that he he references. Joseph Campbell is in there. You can see his reading list on his blog site. You know, Jung, really important to him. Nietzsche. Um, in the case of Joseph Campbell, just so you know, you know, Joseph Campbell is, is actually pretty decent. If you don't know anything about comparative religion and you read the power of myth, take about two or three hours and you'll know a lot more coming out of it than you knew going into it. So Joseph Campbell's actually pretty decent. So what is the revolutionary aspect of, of Jordan Peterson? Like I said, none of his ideas are unique. There's stuff that's been around for a while. Joseph, in Joseph Campbell, in Jung, those are two strong examples. Well, first of all, the revolution was popularizing it. YouTube is the revolutionary aspect of it. What he did was take ideas that had been floating around in the, in the social body, and he put them on YouTube in a way that's entertaining and fun to listen to. His biblical series, I was, I was telling people to check that out three years ago before anybody had ever heard of Jordan Peterson. And I, I, you know, Rachel and Rationality Rules didn't seem to think that they were all that worthwhile, but I actually really liked them just as something to listen to, just as entertaining. I've listened to them all, and I find them really, really fun, to, really enjoyable to listen to. So that's a revolutionary aspect. It's talking about comparative religion in a way that's fun and interesting to listen to, and it's a little bit more in-depth than Joseph Campbell, to tell you the truth. But here's the most important part that makes him revolutionary. He is the first person to take these ideas, a la Joseph Campbell, a la Jung, and put them in a context wherein they can be applied to standard Christian apologetics. That's revolutionary. That's the most important part. That's the part that has radically changed the way this game is going to be played going forward. Radically changed. And people don't even perceive it yet. But if you go back and you look at Jordan Peterson versus Sam Harris, and then compare it to Sam Harris versus William Lane Craig. It's a very different ball game. Now, Jordan Peterson is not a standard Christian apologist, but he plays enough of that role in the context of debating someone like Sam Harris that he is using comparative religion. He's using the, the um, what's it called? He's using the uh, phenomenology of religion, philosophy of religion, he's using religion in a much more broader term, but he's using it in, def in a way that is very, very, in the context he's using it, is very similar to standard Christian apologetics. That's why anti-theists and atheists get so tripped out by him. Why? Because they recognize the threat in that. It's what I've talked about in some of my past videos. It is a radical transformation of the way this game is going to be played going forward to, to the benefit of the Christian community. That's why a lot of Christians get on board with him, even though he's not necessarily Christian. Because there's something inside of us recognized immediately, this is different. This is important. This is taking, you know, you go, as I've said in the past, you go watch, you go to watch a debate with like Ken Holm versus Aaron Ra. You can't even get through it. <laughs> Honestly, you can't. You can't get through it. It just, it just doesn't work, you know. Um, but there's no way that the, the main arguments of Aaron Ra, for example, the main counter-apologetics of atheism, they don't hold any candle to the stuff that Peterson is talking about. He, he kind of obliterates them. You know? It's in the context of what Peterson... What, if you go and listen to his biblical series and recast it in the context of as a defense of traditional religion, and then it all of a sudden becomes extraordinarily powerful and useful and, yes, revolutionary. So, revolutions are, as I said, their, their antecedents are often mundane. His antecedents are mundane. Jung, Joseph Campbell. You go read his reading list. There's another guy in there, I keep forgetting his name, some uh, Iliad that's in his top ten books that you should read. The Power of Religion or something like that. Um, there's a lot of these type of people. Karen Armstrong, there's a guy, John Vervacki, but they don't usually present themselves in, a, in the context of, tra of traditional religious apologetics. Peterson does. Peterson does. That's the revolutionary aspect because these can't be defended against. The ideas that Peterson is putting forth are not all that unique and groundbreaking in terms of the originality of the ideas themselves. But in terms of the context of a defense of traditional religion, revolution, you know, total revolution. Total revolution. He's the Sex Pistols of today's world. He's the Clash, even more important. Yeah, he's the Clash. So, 
That's all on that for now. That's all I have to say. Amen.